board on McLeod. So I made the observation um, last week, this would have been, that most limits in practice are easy to take. I mean, I also made the observation that the limits we care about most of the time are sort of the exception to this rule, so it's an unfortunate uh, dichotomy. But today we'll talk about continuity. We'll get as far as we can get anyway. Um, and continuity is basically this, what I just said, that most limits are easy to take, that you can just plug C in to take the limit. And before I talk about continuity that way, let's try to get it down a little more informally. Suppose I was going to graph the temperature versus the time for a day. And suppose that I gave you a graph that looked like that. I mean, that would be a pretty odd temperature graph. I mean, I would go so far as to say that it's an impossible temperature graph because of this jump here. I mean, the day warms up, it cools down. It can't be 60 degrees one moment and then 80 degrees the next without anything happening in between. So this gap here is unrealistic in most real world situations. This gap you might also remember from a few weeks back now is also an example of a limit not existing. If this is C, then the limit as x approaches c of this function does not exist. And the idea that this is not a realistic graph and the fact that the limit fails to exist at that value and in fact, the limit fails to exist at the value that I signed up as being unrealistic. I mean, these things are related to each other. They're not three uh, unrelated pieces of information. <coughs> Definition. A function f of x is continuous at c, some value c, if one f of c exists to the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists and three these quantities are equal the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c. So a function being continuous means mathematically that its limit is easy to take. You just take that c and you plug it into the function and you found the limit. And 
And the vast majority of day-to-day -day functions are continuous at the vast majority of points, which is how we can formally justify my statement that most limits are easy to take. Uh, before we get into the math, let me say that um, most real-world quantities are modeled by functions that are continuous everywhere. Like when we looked at this temperature function and I said, well, I don't think that looks realistic at C. I don't think a temperature should be able to jump like that. Well, this function is discontinuous at C. It's not continuous at C because it violates that second condition. The limit doesn't exist. Um, so most real world situations are continuous. Um, points of discontinuity in the real world are generally reflect some outside force acting on a system. And I mean, I can give you a classic example where we do see discontinuity. Let's see, I want this up here. If we drop an object from a sufficiently high height, like if we drop an object out of a plane, the velocity graph is going to look something like that. The velocity is going to be negative because it is falling. We'll talk about that later. Um, the object will not accelerate forever. It will reach a terminal velocity and maintain that velocity until it hits the ground, at which point its velocity will abruptly become zero. So, going back to what I said earlier about the idea that discontinuities usually reflect some outside force coming into a system and acting on it, here the system is this object falling through the air and it becomes discontinuous when an outside force, to wit, the ground acts on it. So, um, most real world quantities are continuous. And I mean, I mean you, can, you can think of other, like in engineering, we normally uh, just think of switches as going on and off instantly. So engineering is another good example where you see moments of discontinuity. Something's on, then suddenly it's off, and the system is different somehow. But in fact, I'd say that discontinuities occur most frequently in human-made disciplines. You see them in business, for example. Most functions are continuous at most values. Um, let's uh, try to take that kind of vague statement involving like vague words like most, and let's try to nail it down. So, this definition is standard, it's really awkward, and I think a little confusing, um, but nobody consulted me on it. A function 
is called continuous if it is continuous everywhere it is defined. So it may look like I'm repeating myself and we have two definitions of continuity, but that's not the case. Here, we're defining continuity at a specific value. We're continuous at five, or we're continuous at negative seven. This definition doesn't involve any specific values. It's the statement that the function is continuous everywhere it is defined, which is, in my opinion, slightly weird and, and, and lends itself to some slightly weird statement. For example, the statement f of x equals 1 over x is a continuous function. It is not continuous. At zero. I mean, those two sentences don't contradict each other. It's not continuous at zero because it flunks one of the continuity conditions. It's not defined at zero. But because the definition of continuity is only looking at what happens when the function is defined, since it's not defined at zero, we're not asking what happens at zero. So we have a continuous function with discontinuity which, going back to what I said earlier, that's definitely slightly more sounding. So we sometimes, um, I mean, this is the definition in the textbook. It's the standard definition. But to try to make this less weird, Often, instead of talking about a function being continuous, we'll talk about a function being continuous on its domain. Remember that a function's domain is where it's defined. So when you say continuous on its domain, you're really stressing this everywhere it's defined bit. And I mean this statement that this function is continuous everywhere it's defined, but it's not defined at zero, that's a lot less awkward sounding. Basically, every day to day function is continuous.
on its domain. Um, so, I mean, this sort of informal statement I made that usually you can find limits just by taking C and plugging it into the function that now has a slightly more formal statement. I mean, I'm now saying that basically every function is continuous. And if you've got a continuous function, then by the definition of continuity, if you want to know what the limit is at C, you just take C and stick it in there. Uh, I can make this more formal still by abandoning the phrase basically every and giving us a concrete list. power functions f of x equals x raised to some power. These functions are continuous on their domain. And again, we always want to be a little careful with that on their domain, if here we go, let's get Desmos up. The example I looked at, um, 1 over x, that's a power function. That's x to the negative first power. And because this is a power function, it's continuous on its domain, but not every number is in the domain. Zero isn't. So if we want to know what the limit is as x, as x approaches 2.6, we just stick 2.6 in there and we get 0.385. If we want to know the limit as x approaches 7.26, we just stick 7.26 in there and we get 0.138. If we want to know the limit as x approaches 0, well, that limit doesn't exist. As x approaches 0, this function is going to infinity. It's not approaching a finite number. And I mean, the good thing about, um, you know, continuity on its domain, like if you're doing a homework problem and you see what's the limit as x approaches zero, I mean, you can, if you, uh, you can stick zero in there and you'll get one divided by zero and you'll say to yourself, okay, this is a division by zero error. This function isn't defined here. It's not continuous here. Let's see. All six trig functions are continuous. Again, this on the domain bit is uh, important. The, uh, the two sort of most famous trig functions, the sine of x and the cosine of x, these functions are defined everywhere. Their domain is all of, yeah, let me uh, go to the y-axis and 
make this a little <laughs> okay. It's still sort of hard to make out. But these functions are continuous everywhere, like at every real number, because the sine and the cosine are defined at every real number. So they're continuous on their domains. They're also just continuous everywhere. Contrast that with the tangent, which... Let's remind ourselves what the tangent is. It's the sine over the cosine. And the cosine is periodically zero. So like at negative <coughs> pi over two, the tangent is not defined because at negative pi over two, there's a division by zero error. So we say the tangent is continuous, but the tangent is not continuous at negative pi over two because it's not defined find at negative pi over 2. And again, to try to avoid that kind of awkwardness, we tend to say that the tangent is continuous on its domain. Um... We're not going to do anything with these until calculus 2, but if you've taken pre-calculus or trigonometry, then just for the record, the inverse trig functions are all continuous on their domains. Um, the logarithm, that's, uh, if I group these together, then I might be able to get away with just having one frame. The logarithmic and exponential functions are continuous on their domain. The informal graphical explanation, if I were trying to explain continuity to somebody who didn't know any calc to this, I'd say a function's continuous if you can draw the curve without lifting your pen from paper. You see the exponential function is this smooth curve. There are no gaps. There are no jumps. It is continuous everywhere. And e to the x, by far the most famous exponential function, but they all look basically the same, and they're all continuous everywhere. The logarithm of x isn't literally continuous everywhere because it's not defined everywhere. You can't take the logarithm of zero. You can't take the logarithm of a negative number. But where it is defined, it's continuous. It's continuous on its domain. So, can I give, I mean, the, am I missing any standard functions? I'm missing functions that are built up from this. Like, I haven't talked about polynomials because those are just a bunch of power functions added together. But I think these are all the kind of fundamental building blocks type functions. Uh, 
a function that's not continuous on its domain. Um, there are a few kind of standard ones, nothing as nothing as major as these, but like, have, it, have any of you seen the floor function before? So the floor function is basically the round down function. It takes decimals and rounds them down. So like 1.7 gets rounded to 1. Uh, integers are left alone. And the reason um, the floor function shows up, I mean, why would you want to round 1.7 down? Why not round it properly? Well, in, I mean, if you're looking at storage, for example, you need to store cars. You can't store 1.7 cars if your garage has room for 1.7 cars. It really has room for one car. So it gets used in contexts like that. I don't know if... Let's uh, see if it's not floor, I don't, ah, it is floor. And we can see the graph of this thing. It's defined everywhere, but it has these periodic jumps. So like at Five. There we go. It is defined at five, but it's got a jump here. It's not continuous. So that's kind of the prototypical example of a function that's defined everywhere, but not uh, continuous everywhere. I'm zero, zero, I want to say. This, you don't need to commit this to memory or anything. But this piecewise defined function is called the heavy side function. Um, the heavy side function, the one half at zero doesn't really matter. That's there for technical reasons we don't want to get into. But the heavy side function represents a switching process, a switch that gets turned on. So it's sort of, think of this as a binary expression, zero off, one on. So this heavy side function is defined at zero. It's not continuous at zero because at zero there is a jump. If we... Look at this. So this is zero when x is less than zero. And then let me make the colors all the same. Here's the graph of the heavy side function. It's defined at zero, but you see there's this jump. Um, 
as a side note, I phrased the heavy side function in terms of a switch. It does get used a lot in sort of engineering, for example, but it, it has a lot of uh, applications outside engineering, like it's used in biology. When, um, in particular, this is an example I might come back to a few times because it's what I did my doctorate in, um, the cell division cycle. So when you're looking at like a cell going through its cell division cycle, it goes through the cycle, it hits a checkpoint, it sits at the checkpoint until there is enough resources for it to divide, and then it passes the checkpoint. And that process of sitting at that checkpoint until there are resources and it can start moving again are modeled using this kind of binary method as zero and one. So it, oops, so it's not only used when there's a um, literal switch, it shows up elsewhere as well. Um, note, by the way, the heavy side function is not continuous everywhere. The heavy side function is continuous at most points, though. And this is true in general, that even if a function has discontinuities, it's continuous at most places. I mean, this heavy side function is defined at an infinite number of numbers. It's defined at every single real number. There is only one real number, zero, where it's discontinuous. What's more, Functions built from continuous functions are generally going to be continuous. So, if f of x and g of x are continuous, so are f plus g and f minus g and f times g. Uh, one uh, algebraic operation, sort of uh, notable for its absence from this list, division can break continuity. And I'll talk about that shortly. But addition, subtraction, and multiplication cannot. So, X is continuous. I mean, you can look at the graph. It clearly doesn't have any jumps or breaks in it. A more formal way of thinking would be that X is a power function. It's X to the first. And I've said that power functions are continuous. I've also said that trigonometric functions are all continuous. The sign is continuous. Let me see. I no longer really want these all to be the same color. So if I multiply, if I multiply them, x times the sine of x, this product has to be continuous.
continuous. It's built out of x, which is continuous. It's built out of the sine of x, which is continuous. So this product, let me show it to you by itself. This product is a continuous function. Uh, similarly, if I had x plus the sine of x, that's going to be continuous. If I had x minus the sine of x, that's going to be continuous. Looking ahead a little, if I have x divided by the sine of x, suddenly there are a whole bunch of places where this function is no longer defined and no longer continuous. x is defined and continuous everywhere. The sine of x is defined and continuous everywhere x over the sine of x is frequently not defined, so it's frequently not continuous. And I mean, this is the same, the same argument we saw when we were looking at the tangent. Um, the sine is zero infinitely often, when the sign is zero, this is a division by zero error. So the function isn't defined, so it cannot be continuous. So let me make sort of a special statement about division. If f of x is continuous on its domain and g of x is continuous on its domain, well, so is f of x over g of x. But its domain might not include values where f of x and g of x are defined. So this is not true here. If f of 5 and g of 5 are both defined, then f plus g of 5 f minus g of 5 and f times g of 5 are all defined. Not so with division. Because we might get division by zero. Errors. 
if f of 5 is defined and g of 5 is defined, but g of 5 equals 0, then f of 5 over g of 5 is not defined. I mean, we looked at this example. I mean, we've seen a bunch of examples of this by now. In particular, we've talked about this in terms of trig functions. The sine of x continuous on all the real numbers defined everywhere. The cosine of x continuous and defined on all of the real numbers. The tangent of x, which is the sine of x divided by the cosine of x, suddenly not defined and not continuous at a bunch of points at every value where the cosine is zero. Um, one. not showing up. Okay, that made it show up. A constant function is continuous everywhere, it's defined everywhere. So one is continuous and defined everywhere. The sine of x is continuous and defined everywhere. One over the sine of x what trigonometric function is 1 over the sine of x? Is it cosine? Or cosecant? Oh, cosecant. Cosecant, thank you. Don't, uh, again, it, it's easy to get confused that what, like 1 over the cosine should be the cosecant, but that's not the way it works. 1 over the sine is. And the, um, 1 over the sine, the cosecant, has a bunch of values where it's not defined and um, therefore not continuous. Although, again, this is continuous on its domain. And then I'm going to let's see, composition of continuous functions are continuous. And again, we ha I'm writing continuous, maybe I should be writing continuous on their the reason I'm saying continuous <laughs> is that compositions of function, you can't say compositions of continuous on their domain functions. I guess it would be compositions of functions that are continuous on their domain. It's a little awkward to write, so I'm just saying continuous. But you have to remember that continuous means continuous on the domain. So compositions of continuous functions are continuous. And <coughs> reminding ourselves, a composition occurs when you have one function stuck inside of another function, like the sine of something, the sine of e to the x. 
weeks. That's uh, quite a graph we're getting, but this function is continuous everywhere. e to the x is continuous, the sine is continuous, when we compose them it's continuous. Similarly, e to the sine of x, well, the exponential function e to the x is continuous, the sine is continuous, their composition is continuous. Uh, the logarithm of x squared. The logarithm is continuous, x squared is continuous, so their composition is continuous. The composition is not continuous at zero, however, because this composition is not defined at zero. Zero squared is zero. The logarithm of zero is undefined. Um, Something like, I don't know, 1 plus x times the sine of x all raised to the one-third power. I mean, we, well, I, but I think I speak for all of us when I say that I have, we have no intuition about what this graph looks like. Um, like whether it jumps around, whether it has gaps in it. Um, we cannot, I mean, if I ask you to graph this without using a calculator or any other technology, we'd probably all be at C. But we can say, this. We can say one is continuous, and the sine is continuous, and x is continuous. So this product is continuous, this sum is continuous, this is a composition, this is all inside the cubed root. The cubed root is a power function, so it's continuous. So whatever it looks like, this function is built up entirely from continuous functions, so it will be continuous. So if we look at it, here it is, and indeed there are no jumps, there are no gaps, there is nothing that would make this function discontinuous. Um, so there's stuff we didn't do, which is fine, because, I mean, we still have Thursday, even if we're not going to be meeting in person. Um, there's a very classic kind of example that gets done with continuity. Um, just because it tests so many things. It tests continuity, and it tests limits, and it tests one-sided limits. And that's looking at piecewise defined functions and trying to decide whether the function is continuous at the joints where the pieces meet. So I think that the only material we didn't cover. Nope, I'm wrong. There was also, let me get, uh, get the white board. There's piecewise functions. And then there is something called the intermediate value 
theorem. So these both have canvas pages and your assignment for Thursday, I mean your class assignment is to go to those pages, watch the videos, read the notes. And then there will be homework. There should be two sections, one on one-sided limits and two, one on this, on continuity. So if that's not up already, I'll open it. And I will see you Monday.